All right, I invite you to open up with me to the book of Acts once again as we turn to chapter 4 this morning. And just by way of introduction, I'll say that chapter 4 follows on the heels of chapter 3. Oh, big surprise. Chapter 4 follows chapter 3, doesn't it? You know, that sounded really stupid. (laughs) There was a point I was trying to make (laughs) until my mouth just made my brain sound really dumb. Um, In chapter 3, if you were with us last week, we looked at this healing, this miraculous healing from the apostles in chapter 3. It's the first miracle that we see in the book of Acts performed by the apostles. And it's important to keep that in mind because what happens in chapter 4 is really in response to that that miracle. Because as that miracle happened, then in chapter 4 we see what the response is from the religious leaders and authorities who are reacting to what the apostles are doing and their reaction is not very pleased, as you will see. They are not pleased with what the apostles are doing. So I'm going to be reading Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And When they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man, the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they Uh, They let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the boldness 
of your apostles. We thank you for the boldness of those who have gone before us in the faith. And Lord, we pray that you would give us that same boldness. May we resolve this morning, Lord, as we hear your word and as we understand your word, to be faithful and committed to your word and to hold fast to your word against the pressures and the opposition that this world may bring. Lord, may it be so. Teach us this morning, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 3, we saw a first, and it was the first miracle that the apostles performed in the New Testament. And in Acts chapter 4, we see another first, and it is the first instance of Christian persecution in the New Testament, in the church. A lot of people think of persecution as something that is, yes, maybe present today in some circles, but mostly it's a thing of the past. It's mostly something we read about in the Bible or something in history books. And nothing could be further from the truth. had a vivid example of this just this past week as as I listened to Andrew Brunson talk about being imprisoned for two years simply because he was a follower of of Jesus. Christian persecution is very common today. In fact, more Christians today are persecuted for being followers of Jesus than at any other point in church history. And I want you to watch this quick video clip. This is a video from an organization called Open Doors, and it's an organization that focuses on Christian persecution. And each year they put together what's called the World Watch List, which tries to assess what is the state of Christian persecution around the world. And this quick video clip tells you about the World Watch List for 2019. I want you to watch this clip. For over 25 years, Open Doors has been producing the World Watch List, which ranks the top 50 countries where it's most difficult to be a Christian. The list is compiled by a group of experts, audited by an outside organization specializing in religious freedom, and is the best and most authoritative list of its kind. Through on-the-ground interviews and data analysis, it provides an accurate picture of the difficulties persecuted Christians face around the world. For each country, the list looks at a variety of factors persecuted Christians endure in their public and private lives, such as persecution from the government, the community, and even from their own families. Open Doors estimates that in the top 50 countries alone, 245 million believers face intimidation, prison, and even death. That is one in nine Christians worldwide. But the list is not just numbers and figures. It represents those who have decided to follow Jesus no matter the cost. We believe there is only one body of Christ, and when one part suffers, every part suffers. We hope you feel called to learn more and pray for the millions of believers around the world where persecution is a daily reality. Here are a few other numbers that stand out to me as I look at the world watch list for 2019. They said in the video, 245 million in the top 50 world watch list countries alone, 245 million Christians experience high levels of persecution for their choice to follow Christ. Now, just listen to that carefully. That's only in the top 50 world watch list countries. There's far more than that, but that's just in the top 50. One in nine Christians worldwide experience high levels of persecution. Uh, 4,136 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons in the top 50 World Watch List countries uh, for 2019. 2,625 Christians were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned in the top 50 World Watch List countries. Now, many people aren't really aware of these realities, and they're shocked to discover how common Christian persecution is in the world today, and and shocked to discover that persecution in general is even a reality. But one of the things that we see if we go back to the New Testament is that persecution 
is actually something that we're told to expect. I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Mark 13, 9. He said, Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Or listen to what Jesus said in John 15. He said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So these words are a reminder that actually Jesus said that we should expect Persecution. if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. And the reason is not uh, because Christians are looking for some kind of opposition or persecution. It's because Jesus himself was not well received by much of the world. His message was not well received by much of the world. And so if you're a follower of Jesus and you also believe and teach and, and share that message, why should you expect a different reception from the world than the reception that Jesus received from the world? You know, this is so important. One of the things that was really interesting this past week, when I heard Andrew Brunson speak, in one of his messages, he said something to me that was, was kind of surprising. I guess it wasn't surprising, but it was a focus that I didn't expect him to say. And as he talked about his time in prison, he said God, he felt that God was calling him to, uh, to talk to the American church and to place an emphasis on the American church because he felt that the American church is just not prepared for persecution. Uh, he, he said, and he feels, that it will become increasingly difficult to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus in the years to come. In the decades to come, it will be increasingly difficult to be a follower of Jesus. To hold biblical beliefs and to live a biblical lifestyle is going to be increasingly difficult because the world it does not receive that message well. And it will not just be difficult in these countries that you just heard about in the video, but right here in the United States. And he said, the American church is not prepared. People are not prepared. And they need to get prepared. So where does that leave us? Well, this passage from, from Acts chapter 4, I think, is very, very important. Because as I said, it's the first instance of Christian persecution that we read about in Acts. But it teaches us a lot about persecution as well. And so I want to look at this passage and look at two big questions when it comes to this passage. The first question is, what kind of persecution did the early church face? And then the second question we'll look at a little bit later is, how did the early church respond to persecution? So first of all, what kind of persecution did the early church face? What kind of persecution was it that they were facing that we see here in Acts? Well, we see here the who and the why and the how, and I want to say something about each of those. Who, first of all, was persecuting them? If you look at this passage, you'll see that it was not just one individual, it was not just one group of individuals, but it was actually a number of different categories of people, a number of different groups who were persecuting believers. And in verse 1, you see first three categories of people. It says the, the priests the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Now, the priests were, of course, the leaders who oversaw the temple. The captain of the temple was sort of like the chief of police for the temple. You probably didn't know that, that the temple had its own chief of police. Well, they, they had their own security. And, the, and the, temple was, uh, the captain of the temple was like the chief of police for the temple. And then the Sadducees, the Sadducees were just one sect uh, of, of believers within Judaism, um, and they were one of the more influential sects. And uh, so we have those three groups mentioned in verse 1, three powerful groups. Verse 5 adds three more groups to the list. We are told that there was also the rulers and the elders and the scribes. Now, rulers probably just referred to religious leaders in general across the board. Elders probably didn't refer to religious leaders, but in this case, these would have been like the civic leaders or the family leaders within the community. And then the scribes were the highly respected teachers of the law. Those three groups, the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, made up what was called the Sanhedrin, 
or the religious council, the same council that tried Jesus. So what do we have here? In summary, you've got six different groups or categories of people, and that's not even to mention a whole bunch of different other individuals in the passage who are also putting pressure on the believers. And what this tells us is that opposition to the gospel does not just come from one category of people. It doesn't come from just one segment of society, but it can come from lots of different angles and in lots of different ways. This was true in the first century. It's true today, isn't it? There are lots of different ways that the world can be opposed to the Christian faith or opposed to followers of Jesus, and you know this to be true. Uh, There is social opposition And right now I'm kind of just speaking in terms of our experience in the American uh, uh, part of the world here, but there's social opposition. So many Christians are told in uh, their jobs or in their workplaces that they're not allowed to talk about their faith. Uh, There is intellectual opposition. Uh, At many American colleges and universities have become environments that are hostile to Orthodox Christianity. Uh, There's legal opposition. So that in many uh, segments of society now, there are laws that make it increasingly difficult for Christian institutions or nonprofits to operate according to their own beliefs. And these are just a few examples. But the point is that the opposition, the who of persecution, can take many different shapes and it can take many different forms. And you see that right here in Acts chapter 4. That's the who. What about the why? Why were they being persecuted? Verse 2 gives us the answer. Verse 2 says that these various groups were, quote, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. There you have it, right there. Why were they being persecuted? They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, you might look at that and say, big deal. Why is that such a cause for persecution? Well, it's cause for persecution for multiple reasons. Number one, I mentioned a few minutes ago the group, the Sadducees. One of the things that was unique to the Sadducees is uh, they didn't believe in this concept of the resurrection. And so when the the Christians began uh, preaching this idea of resurrection from the dead, that would have annoyed them simply because their certain beliefs about the resurrection were not consistent. But on a more broad level, going beyond the Sadducees to all these other groups, by proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus and proclaiming him as savior of the world, uh, these Christians were saying that there's only one savior and there's only one way and we're going to tell you who that savior is and we're going to tell you who that Messiah is and that message would have been offensive to all these other groups that didn't agree, both Jew and Gentile. The Jews of the day would say, well, we don't agree with that and we think it's offensive because we don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. The Gentiles mocked it and laughed too because they said, what are you talking about, this idea that that there's this this one God and that Jesus is is his Son? I mean, we we know that's not true. There are lots of other gods out there and and you're, you're all full of baloney. So from many, many different angles, they were pressured, and they, the people, were offended. They were offended by this message. Uh, They were offended by the proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and that he was the Savior. And you know, I was reflecting on this, and I was thinking, the same thing really is true today when you think about it. The reality is, in our culture, now let's just talk about our world, not first century world, You can talk about Jesus as long as you keep it real generic, right? If you talk about Jesus as he's he's a great historical figure, he was a great spiritual teacher, he was kind of a great spiritual guru, I mean, pretty much everybody will be on board with you. Most non-Christians actually like talking about Jesus at that level. Yeah, he had lots of good things to say. He was a real ethical stand-up guy, maybe one of the most... Uh, loving people in all of human history. If you keep it on that level, it's acceptable in our culture. But what happens when you ratchet it up and you say, well, I don't just believe that. Jesus isn't just a good guy. But the Bible says Jesus, Jesus himself said 
he is the savior of sinners. And that not only, first of all, you need to be saved. And, first, and then second of all, he's the only guy who can do it. He is the only savior of the world and he is the divine son of God. Once you get up to that level, all of a sudden, the message is not so widely accepted. And people become, should I say, greatly annoyed. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, greatly annoyed. Can you relate to that? The message gets annoying when it gets more biblical. The same thing is true today, and it always has been. It's always caused controversy, and let me tell you this. The gospel is always going to be offensive to certain groups. It just always will. When Jesus preached, some believed, some were offended and walked away. And if we don't think that that's going to be the same reality today, then we're living in a delusion. Some people will always be offended when you teach what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. And one of the implications for that is if when we talk about Jesus, no one is ever offended, we're probably not talking about the Jesus of the Bible. We're probably not really preaching the gospel. The gospel always causes people to get annoyed. And this was happening in their day. So, the who, we see the why. What about the how? How are they being persecuted? Well, the short answer is, same thing they said in that World Watch List video, intimidation. Intimidation, verse 3 says this, they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Why do you think they put them in custody? We're only going to be there overnight. The answer, it's called intimidation. They were trying to intimidate these believers. They were trying to scare them into silence, and they were trying to stop their preaching and their influence. Now, it didn't work, did it? Because you read the rest of Acts chapter 4, and really the rest of the book of Acts, didn't stop their preaching, did it? They just kept preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. And if anything, it just made them more bold. We're going to keep preaching anyway. But it also didn't stop their influence. Look at what verse 4 says. Many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. It's just growing and growing and growing. You see, intimidation cannot stop the spread of the truth. And yet, too often, we let ourselves be intimidated today, don't we? I want you to listen to these words from James Montgomery Boyce, who wrote this. He said, if Christianity is true, it is the greatest message in the world. Yet, we are afraid to proclaim it, and the major reason is the world's intimidation. We're afraid to speak because we think that someone might laugh at us or harm us. But what we discover in Acts, which we also find in later church history and see in our day too if we just look around, is that the more the church is oppressed, the more the gospel spreads. You know where the church is growing most rapidly in the world today? It's not in the United States. It's in areas of the world where oftentimes believers face intense persecution. The more the church is oppressed, the more the gospel spreads. So this is the who and the why and the how that the early church was being persecuted. Let's go to the second question then. How did the early church respond to persecution? And I want to mention three different ways in this passage that they responded. First of all, they responded with bold speech. Bold speech. The day after they were imprisoned, religious leaders called them out and they forced them to explain themselves. Again, the, the approach here is intimidation. And they want them to explain themselves. Why is it that you've healed this man back in chapter 3? By what power are you doing these things? What gives you the right to preach such things? Verse 7, it says, by what power, by what name did you do this? And then it says this in verse 8. Peter says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Now think about those words for a minute. Can you imagine the guts that it would take for Peter to say that? He's standing there before, in front of incredibly powerful people, 
Remember, I said to you, these are some of the same individuals or categories of individuals who put Jesus on trial and sent him away to be crucified. Now, Peter looks at them straight in the face, <laughs> and he said, no, he could have given a real safe answer. He could have given a real safe answer here. They says, but by what power, by what name are you doing these things? And he could have just kept it generic and still he could have been truthful. He could have just said, well, Jesus, can I go get lunch now? <laughs> you know, just, let's just keep it as basic as possible. He doesn't do that. He says, this Jesus, he looks at him straight in the face, this Jesus, the, the same man you crucified. And oh, by the way, the man who God raised from the dead, not to just add a little more controversy in there, a little more fuel to fire, the man whom you crucified and who God raised from the dead is the man that we're doing these things by. Imagine that for a minute. But he doesn't stop there. Look at what he says to them next in verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's pretty bold. Now he's not just saying, this is the Jesus who you folks crucified. He's not just saying, this is the guy, by the way, whom God raised from the dead, whether you believe it or not. But, oh, by the way, there's salvation in no one else. And if you don't turn to Jesus, there's no salvation except through him alone. And that's it. This is just after he's released from prison. <laughs> that's bold. This is bold speech. You know, it reminds me of a story that I came across of a 19th century preacher, a guy by the name of Peter Cartwright. <clears throat> and one Sunday morning, Peter Cartwright was scheduled to preach in a church in Tennessee, and he traveled all over the country and preached at different churches. Um, but he was preaching in Tennessee, and his deacons told him that President Andrew Jackson was going to be there that morning in the congregation. And they knew that Peter Cartwright was the kind of guy who just said whatever he wanted. <laughs> regardless of how people would react. And so they warned him, his leaders told him, uh, don't say anything that might offend President Andrew Jackson. So when it came up time for him to speak, he stood up and he said this. He said, quote, I understand President Andrew Jackson is here. I have been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent just said that. This is a true story. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent. The congregation was shocked. <laughs> you imagine that? The congregation was shocked. And afterwards, Andrew Jackson came up to Peter Cartwright. And he said this. He said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. Because he recognized how bold Peter Cartwright was. Bold speech in the face of intimidation. Not a willingness to compromise, but bold speech. And this is what you see in Acts 4. That's one of the ways that they responded to persecution. But there's more than that. They also responded not just with words, but with action. And so the second piece is bold action. After Peter's speech, the religious leaders, the intimidation continues because they forbid them to continue preaching about Jesus. They say, get out of here, but don't talk about Jesus or the resurrection anymore. Verse 18, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. What would you do? What would you do? Someone says to you, you may not speak about Jesus. Verse 19, this is what they say. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So what did they do? This is the action. They didn't just speak boldly, but they said, we are going to continue to act boldly. We're going to continue to preach. We're going to continue to teach. We're going to continue to do our ministry and if you think that that's wrong, well, that's fine with you, but we must obey God rather than men. We are going to do what God tells us to do. See, the early church, they recognized that God was a higher authority than 
man. And this is something that is a really important principle throughout church history. Christians have always recognized that there are different authorities in our lives that are good authorities that God tells us to obey. Our parents, as we are growing up in the household, we are told to obey our parents, to honor our mother and our father. That's a God-given command, and they're God-given authorities. We are told in other places in Scripture that we are to obey the governing authorities, the civil authorities in our lives. Paul says in Romans 13 that you are placed, uh, wherever you live in this world, you are placed in a country where there are governing uh, civil authorities that rule, and uh, God uses those uh, for his purposes, and so we're called to obey the civil authorities. But the question is, what happens when one of those authorities and their word comes into conflict with God's word? Because this has happened many times throughout history, where the civil authorities or other religious authorities in the world tell Christians that they cannot live their faith or they cannot speak their faith or follow Jesus the way Jesus has commanded. So now all of a sudden you have one set of commands coming in conflict to another set of commands God's law. And so what do you do? Well, what the early Christians recognized is that God's law is higher than man's law. God's word is higher than man's word, and if the two ever come into conflict, we must obey God rather than men. This is what Daniel did. When you think back to the story of Daniel, which is maybe one of the most familiar stories in the Bible, and Daniel was told, you cannot pray and you cannot worship another god. What did Daniel do? You want to talk about boldness? You remember what happened in that story? He goes up to pray as usual, and he gets down on his knees and opens up his windows <laughs> and gets down on his knees and he prays. He says, I'm going to do exactly what I've always been doing because your word is not higher than God's word. And if I have to choose between obeying man versus obeying God, if I have to choose between obeying the civil authorities versus obeying God's authority, God's word is higher. The apostles recognized that. What would you do? You know, I keep thinking back to what Andrew Brunson said this past week, and he says, you know, it's in the coming years, it will become increasingly difficult to be a follower of Jesus. And there could come times when you are told you cannot live the way that Jesus calls you to live. You cannot speak the way that Jesus calls you to speak. And what would you do? Are you prepared to do what the apostles did and say, no, I must obey God rather than men, regardless of what consequences might come, because there may be consequences. There was for Daniel. You know, God didn't just pat Daniel on the back and say, good job, I'll get rid of that, that king for you. No, he threw him into the lion's den. And let me say this too. Yes, Daniel was delivered from the lions, but there have been thousands of other Christians if you want to talk about the Roman Empire, who were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, and they died. Now, I'm not telling you that to try to scare you. <laughs> I'm telling you that to, to show you that for those individuals, following God and obeying God was more important than obeying Caesar, even if that meant they had to give their lives up. And there are many other Christians today who are faced with that same choice. They responded with bold speech. They responded with bold action. And then thirdly, I don't want you to miss this, they responded with bold prayer. After their release from custody, if you read the end of uh, the last section of the passage we read today, they gather together with the other Christians, and the first thing that they do is pray. That's significant. And, and there's so many things I could say about this prayer. I could preach a whole sermon on this prayer. But I don't have time to do that, so let me t mention two things. Two things about this prayer. First of all, I want you to see that in this prayer, the prayer is rooted in God's sovereignty. It's all about God's sovereignty. Listen to how the prayer begins in verse 24. It says, They lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The prayer begins with, Sovereign Lord, we recognize that you are sovereign. And I want you to see that that's very significant here because it shows that what they understand is that God is sovereign over everything that is happening in your life and my life and in all the world. And they believe God was even sovereign over the persecution that they were going through. He was sovereign over that. That was part of his plan as well. 
You know, so often I think we, we have this idea that when, when opposition or persecution might come into our life, that somehow, um, that, that, well, things aren't going according to God's plan. Well, that might precisely be God's plan. And they understood that. They said, Sovereign Lord, we recognize you're sovereign over everything. You're even sovereign over this. So even in the midst of our persecution, you are not out of control, God. You are in control of this situation. And we trust that this situation is playing out according to your will and your purposes. The only way you can encounter and face opposition and persecution without it undoing you is if you have a big view of God's sovereignty and you recognize that, hey, this is not outside of God's control. God is still in control. And I trust in his sovereignty. If you don't have that mindset, then this kind of situation would undo you. But they acknowledge God's sovereignty. But the other thing I want you to see is what they pray for. This is crazy. They ask, what do they ask for? They ask for more boldness. Verse 29 says, Now, Lord... Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. That's their primary prayer request. Would that be your primary prayer request in this situation? It probably wouldn't be mine. My primary prayer request would be, Lord, I need a plane ticket to Hawaii, okay? (laughs) I want to get out of this mess. And I want to sit on a beach somewhere and not have to deal with this. You know, I was conscious of the fact that oftentimes when we pray for the persecuted church worldwide, and if you've been at Highview for any length of time, you know we bring this up repeatedly, and we do pray for the persecuted church. But oftentimes, our tendency as Americans, when we pray for the persecuted church, is to pray, Lord, uh, keep them safe. Lord, remove the persecution that is happening in their lives. But that's not what they prayed for in Acts 4. Do you know they could have prayed, Lord, remove this persecution from us. They could have prayed, Lord, keep me safe. You don't see that anywhere. In fact, I would go so far as to say, I don't think there is a single prayer in the New Testament where a believer says, Lord, keep me safe and secure and comfortable. You don't see that anywhere in the entire New Testament. But you know what is Americans, our prayer lives are almost entirely consumed by when we pray? It's almost always, Lord, keep me safe. Lord, keep me secure in my life. And Lord, keep me comfortable. That's what almost all of our prayers oftentimes are about. And when you begin to look at it, you see that a lot of it is just idolatry. We don't want anything that would come into our lives that would be uncomfortable. We don't want to be in any situation where we might be put in danger. We don't want any kind of circumstance where we might not be secure. And so we don't take any risks for God. Because, of course, we just, in our heads, believe, well, it couldn't be part of God's plan because it's risky. And and so risk is outside of the box of, of what God might call a person to do. And yet, what do you see when the early church prays? They're in the midst of intense persecution. And they don't even pray for God keep us safe and secure. They don't pray that God remove this. They say, Lord, give us more and more boldness. More boldness to continue to preach the word, regardless of what may come. You know, if you look at the New Testament, we are told that there is something more important than our own safety and security. Now, you might say, Stephen's Stephen's just talking crazy this morning. This all sounds a little bit too radical for me. But the gospel, we are told, is more important than even our own lives. Jesus said in Mark 8, 35, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. In other words, according to Jesus, the gospel is worth everything. It's worth giving up everything for. And this is why many Christians have given up their lives for it. The early church prayed for boldness. and God answered that prayer. Look at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And as we'll see as we go through the book of Acts, 
Persecution doesn't stop. In fact, just a couple Sundays from now, we're going to look at another chapter that involves similar stuff. And it keeps coming. But they continue to preach God's word with boldness. And that's going to continue. You know, as we saw in the video clip this morning, the global church continues to face intense persecution. And I agree with those like Andrew Brunson who have said that opposition to Christianity will continue to rise in the American church as well. And so how should we respond? How will you respond? Are you prepared for that? We should respond with bold speech. We should respond with bold action. We should respond with bold prayer. And we need to recognize that we have nothing to lose in following Jesus. And we have everything to gain in giving our lives for the sake of him. For the sake of the one who gave his life for you. Are you ready to give your life for him? God's probably not going to call those of us in this room to physically give up our lives like many believers around the world are faced with every day. Maybe he will. Probably not within our lifetime because of the area of the world that we live. I don't know. There will be other forms of opposition, though. There will be other forms of persecution. As the Apostle Paul said, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. But we need to remember the words of Jesus. If we seek to save our lives, if we seek to make our lives the most important thing in the world, then we're forfeiting our lives. But if we say, I'm willing to give up everything and surrender it all to follow Jesus, regardless of what the cost might be, that's how you find your life. It's in losing your life for him that you find it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of our all. And we so often lose sight of this, Lord. Lord, we live in a time and in a place of this world where we are blessed with many comforts. And yet, those same blessings, Lord, can become curses for us because we so easily become attached to those things and idolize those things. And so we, in doing so, fail to follow you and to take risks for you. Forgive us for that, Lord. And reorient our lives. Remind us what is truly important. You are important. Your word is important. The gospel is important. Lord, help us to be prepared so that whenever we face opposition, we might respond to it boldly, just like the apostles. Lord, I pray that you would use us just as you used them to bring more and more people to saving faith in Christ. For as we heard this morning, Lord, by the mouth of your apostles, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We praise you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.